Well, hello, good afternoon, and welcome to another one of our Advice for the Current Times, brought to you from NHT and Discovery Education. Uh, I'm Andrew Hammond, delighted to be uh, to be with you again, and thank you so much for joining. Um, I hope your term has started well. Busy time. My feet haven't touched the ground. I'm a head teacher at a school here in Wimbledon in southwest London, and uh, it feels like we've been back uh, several months. <laughs> so uh, I hope um, I hope you're looking forward to um, to the weekend. It will be obviously a challenging weekend. It's uh, it's uh, some big events going on, but um, good to have the three days all the same. I'm sure you'll agree. So we're looking forward to that, and it's great to have your company. So you know that you know the drill. I'm sure by now. Um, have your camera and microphone off, um, no offence intended. Uh, submit questions uh, if you wish to. Well, you know we always like to make this a chat, don't we, with our brilliant guest guy, so uh, and who is always very keen and extremely expert in uh, answering your various questions as we go along. So I welcome your comments in the chat, your questions, either in the chat or in the Q&A, the question and answer feature. You're very welcome to share all of that. We do like to make this a two-way street if we can. And if you, if you want to share any of your observations and comments on social then we tend to use a, a hashtag the whole teacher which kind of goes back a bit now when we first conceived of pathway which you'll know is a, a new approach a more holistic approach to personal and professional development of, of educators and teachers and leaders where we we hope to sort of have time to step back and see the whole teacher in front of in front of us in the same way that we tend to try and view the whole child by which i mean it's not just our professional knowledge and understanding important though those things are it's actually also our motivation, our well-being, our sense of self-worth, our empowerment, and so on. And uh, those invisible things are quite tricky. But we think in Pathway we've come up with a, an approach which really looks at the whole teacher so that they can model some of those positive attitudes and behaviours that we love to see in the children. Anyway, more on that later. So that's why we're here, essentially. But we're here to look at a particular part of um, uh, a, a leader's job today. And I'm going to let Guy get into that needs no welcome really, but um, has been heading up the NEHT advice team for, for many years, um, many years, and has spoken to thousands of school leaders like myself, like those of you on the call, um, the back phone on the desk, providing that reassurance and those two things that Guy loves to give us, which we so often need, which is certainty and control. So Guy, before I just wax on, welcome. It's good Hello, to have you uh, here. Hi everybody. Really glad you're here. Really glad to have you joining us today. And um, we've got some big issues today to talk about. We always, in these Advice for the Current Times webinars, try and look at the things that we think are most likely to be in your inbox at the moment. And so, Guy, do you want to maybe talk us through what we're going to be looking at today? Welcome. <laughs> Absolutely. I hope you can see me and hear me clearly. Certainly can. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this year is going to be is another extraordinary year, isn't it? In in many respects, and for all sorts of reasons that were completely out of school leaders and uh, teachers' control. But it is that time of year again. Uh, and although I know some schools may have already completed or part completed some of this process, um, we thought we'd be looking at staff appraisal today uh, and the whole area around um, performance management. Um, and how it can be managed as effectively as possible uh, by not only those who are subject to it, but those who are leading the process. So we're going to touch on, and, and today is very much, a, uh, we'll be presenting to you, and Andrew and I will be discussing the points as we go through. Uh, it's not often that we devote a whole session with a presentation, but in this particular, on this particular occasion, we, we're having to, because there's not much of an alternative but we'll keep it light, we'll keep it pacey, we'll keep it as fresh as we can. Uh, and Andrew and, and I will sort of dip into the product uh, and alert you uh, to those appropriate moments when we reach them. Um, so we'll look at the official position, look at some good practice, uh, a fresh approach to performance management because it, it is a, perhaps a refresher for somebody uh, or some people on the call. Um, and then getting it right and avoiding the pitfalls, uh, as I'm sure we'd all like to... Uh, Try and achieve that at least. Great. Uh, so if if we're ready, um, we'll go through. Uh, the, these aren't long slides. These aren't, um, I'm not going to read them. Uh, I'll leave you to, to do that. But um, the, the current appraisals, uh, appraisal system has been around for 10 years. Um, and it's important that people understand 
who they apply to. Um, they don't apply to any teacher undergoing an induction period, uh, nor do they apply to anyone who's the subject of a formal capability uh, procedure. Support staff aren't covered by the regulations, but may well be covered by your own school's performance management staff appraisal system. Uh, but they're not covered by the regulations which only uh, apply to qualified teachers and those who have achieved uh, QTS. Um, there's no uh, nothing on the statute cards to change the regulations insofar as I know. If there are, uh, we'll let you know about them. But um, until then, we're, we're rather stuck with the 2012 regulations and uh, they're not a bad set of regulations as, as regulations go. So that's all I'm going to say on the official position, Andrew. Uh, no more than that. Yeah. Um, there used to be a little bit of statute in the appraisal regulations, which meant that teachers had to have their appraisal by the end of half term in the autumn, and head teachers had to have their appraisals by the 31st of December. Um, that bit of the statute has been taken away, it was taken away a few years ago. Um, but those dates are still very much the dates that people tend to stick to um, because that they just seem to be, um, you know, reasonably practicable and the dates that everyone's f familiar with uh, and used to. It is an annual appraisal system, so you would, uh, wouldn't uh, hopefully um, chastise me for recommending that you have mid-year reviews. Uh, these don't have to be heavy reviews. These can be very light touch uh, reviews, but um, we'll touch on more upon those uh, in, in the, uh, across the presentation. I just also wanted to mention staff transferring into the school, say mid-year. Um, often get a few, few phone calls from members who have staff transferring to the mid-year and think, well, how does that square with our uh, appraisal uh, arrangements? Um, I think the only thing I can say, and it, it's pretty much what the regulations say, it's common sense. You just try and assimilate um, their current uh, performance management arrangements with, uh, or the ones they've left behind, with the ones that you're going to set them for the remainder of the year. Uh, if you can't assimilate them smoothly, then I would guillotine one set off and start a new set, uh, as long as you're then appraising both sets of uh, performance records uh, at the end of the year. Um, so there's no secrets there, it's just apply common sense. Uh, the same for fixed term contracts. So if you employ somebody whose contract and, and tenure and time of employment with you is, is fixed uh, and therefore limited by time, then um, by all means just set the objectives or set the appraisal arrangements for that period of the fixed term contract. Uh, and make sure they're weighted appropriately. Uh, if, say, somebody's with you for two terms, make sure that you're not setting uh, an annual set of uh, appraisal arrangements. A um, couple of other things there that, that these these are the good these good practice areas, Andrew, are very much the ones that we get phone calls on and uh, yep. inquiries about. Yep. Um, and uh, head teachers often say, "Well, who should be doing my appraisal? Yep. Uh, come into a, a school." Um, typically it's three governors um, and if a head teacher objects to a member of that panel uh, they can raise that objection uh, very fairly and squarely but the regulations allow them to do so uh, and as long as they set out why uh, and have good reasons why someone might not be uh, appropriate to sit on that panel uh, the chair of governors can then take appropriate action to ensure that that person is absented uh, from the process. So you do have the right to do that uh, if you feel it's uh, a, a necessary thing to do. Yeah. Many head teachers, many schools, local authorities, academy trusts um, very much welcome the role of the external advisor. Um, this is someone who often sits outside the school uh, in another sort of role. Um, their role is very much to make sure that the head teacher receives a uh, a fair hearing. Uh, if they do offer advice, the governing body is minded to pay heed to that advice, not ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, their role is also to ensure that the head teacher is assessed against the backdrop of the non statutory 
head teachers standards professional standards um, they have no role con connected to pay this is purely an advisory role based on performance uh, and it's very much the, uh, the the idea of having the external advisor that it brings in an objective voice to the table um, when you're actually appraising the person leading that organization leading that school um, and uh, I think there, there was a fair bit of resistance to them at first um, but I think now that they've uh, taken on the role the role's been around for a number of years now um, it's it's not a bad role to have uh, at all head teachers can delegate the appraisal uh, of staff to their designated line managers um, so please don't feel that just because you're accountable for the staff appraisal system that means you're responsible for doing everyone's appraisal um, I think good good uh, good practice is to spread that load spread that pain um, <laughs> if, if uh, because at a certain times of year in large schools um, that's going to uh, be a heavy workload for, for somebody and again just finally on this point uh, if someone has an objection to uh, their appraiser um, it may be that they, they haven't enjoyed the best relationship with their line manager over the last year um, the head teacher can decide to appoint uh, a different line manager uh, to hold that very appraisal so some good practice ones there and as I said yeah. these are the ones that uh, we get calls from most of our members yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a few more as you might imagine that's not an ex this isn't an exhaustive list um, one of the questions we ask is, you know, where do I get the, the, the motivation? Where do I get the creativity to set objectives from? Um, and, you know, it's very much, we'll use the variety of source documents right from the job description. It could be the school improvement plan. Uh, it could be an Ofsted report. It could be a safeguarding outcome. Um, you know, it, it, it's really down that there's enough discretion in the system to uh, allow you to, to use really whatever source document you wish to use. Um, but often the Ofsted report and the job description are two obvious ones. Mm. Um, allow for flexibility and headroom for issues that emerge throughout the year. Things like a pandemic um, is a good example for something that emerged midway through the school year, didn't it, in March 2020 now. Um, now, obviously, that's a, an extreme example. Um, but sometimes it's good just to allow a little bit of headroom for, for issues that arise through the year. Um, I've, there's a little bit there about objectives still. The, 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 the subject of objectives is a, is a real thorn, I think, in some people's sides. Uh, I think it's because it used to be quite prescriptive, Andrew, um, you know, and it's no longer as prescriptive as it used to be. Uh, there are a number of uh, minimal, maximum objectives. It's what suits the school. Yeah. Um, what the school's demanding uh, of, of its staff at the, in those particular years. Um, and I think really I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that they had some discretion and some flexibility. Uh, and don't be afraid to, to, to adjust them, um, uh, say at the mid-year review. Um, is, it a, is it a general rule of thumb or is it... Is it um something more concrete than that, then one should tend to aim, well, well, let me tell you what I've always done in Headship, yeah. I've always aimed for a whole school target of some description, which is which is usually linked to um, the school improvement plan, obviously, whether it's um, I know more, a particular focus on closing, you know, narrowing the attainment gap or assessment mm. learning or behavior management stuff, uh, a big push across the school. And then, and then some sort of, um, I hate to use the phrase data related, but some target that really is annexed to the pupil's own attainment of progress. And then a bespoke target, based on observations that you've had and discussions with the teacher yeah. bespoke to their practice. You know what I mean? Is that enough? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're really picking up on um, the architecture of, of the, 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 the art of teaching. Uh, yeah. And also you're picking up on, on real, real time evidence of observations, yeah, real -time evidence. Right. Uh, right. classroom observations or task observations. Yeah. I think really what you want to do, I mean, it'd be very easy to sort of pick out the school improvement plan and pick up three objectives for every, probably every single member of staff. Yeah. But that's not going to give you the team that you're probably looking to achieve. Right. Um, right. You want to sort of evaluate someone's practice. Yeah. 
right yeah. what's in the plan but yeah absolutely I, I i would certainly advise people to say take one from the school overall school planning process take one from very much real-time evidence of the of the individual and ultimately you really probably want one related to pupils and their progress that's right, um, sure. which is bringing all of that together yeah yeah um, sure. so yeah it's uh, i think there's there's a little more fle flexibility and a more uh, um, more room for creativity really in the setting of objectives than i think people have ever realized um mm -hmm. and you know the other one to, to look at of course is the uh, the professional standards yeah that's right of after teachers um and you know when you and i have spoken a lot andrew haven't we over the last year or two about well-being yeah. um and you know how people can effectively begin to look after themselves and and make sure that they're equipped as well as equipped as possible to do their job um and a couple of uh, head teachers have approached me over the last period and said can we relate an objective to our well-being um and the answer is yes absolutely in fact one of the presentations we've given is comes up with that very recommendation uh, certainly for school leaders uh, to have a well-being objective uh, nothing wrong with that at all um i think we probably um and, uh, the, the last point i want to make there just for any school leaders on the call is really just to underline that the the, the standards for head teachers uh, the ones that were reintroduced back in 2015 after an 11 year absence uh, are there very very much to inform the appraisal process and that's one of the roles of the external advisor to bridge that gap Andrew between the professional standards for head teachers uh, and the evidence uh, that they're, they're produced at the end of the year um, so all of those are, are good things uh, to have and all of this by the way uh, everything we discussed today is wrapped up in a document that uh, everyone on the call will be sent um, within sort of 24 or 48 hours at the end of this uh, webinar. So um, by all means, make notes, but all of this will be uh, sent to you uh, shortly after the webinar has has closed today. Yeah. What's your What's your feeling, Guy, about the idea that you know both the target setting, you know, meeting, whatever you wish to call it, but the opening meeting that we're having in September, October, and the mid year you know, review, if you like, around Jan, Feb, how much of those conversations can also be, can also uh, cover other areas outside those targets? What I'm trying to say is I wouldn't want to limit my appraisal and my performance management discussions only to those targets. No, absolutely. Yeah. And it would be wrong to do so. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, yeah. the targets are very much there on the radar uh, yeah. of that discussion. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to check in on people's well-being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, to check in on their professional development. Yeah. Uh, if they're doing it, uh, what progress they're making, what impact that's having. You would expect to see it having an impact on the appraisal uh, targets. Um, and whether there's anything else they want to raise, um, you know, something that may be a blockage in the system somewhere um, that they really want to uh, discuss with you. And actually, uh, the straitjacket of a mid year review. If it's pure, if it's a pure mid review, won't allow that to happen. So it, we we've had a question, guy. Before we move on, if that's mm. okay, and it's on, yeah. on. Thank you, Helen, for for sending this in. Um, and the question is, I, I've begun to consider the value of data targets, especially where the data is not end of key stage. Such tracking data that teachers complete themselves in the appraisal thoughts. Not quite sure what Helen means by that second bit, but um, what what are your thoughts on the value of of data related targets <laughs> i think um <clears throat> very good question helen good and question, the whole yeah. the whole issue of data is increasingly important as it as yeah. uh, as schools uh, progress throughout the school year yeah um my advice has always been if you're going to have a data target and they're not bad things to have at all mm -hmm. uh, make it sim simple and straightforward and try and try and uh, anchor the target to a range of outcomes rather than specific. Uh -huh. uh, I, was, I was once shown a, a, um, a target from a, a member of ours 
uh, and I looked at it and thought these these are so unreasonable because they're they're sort of they're looking at ninety five percent achievement across you know all year groups in most sub core subjects. And the advice I gave that person was, look, you need to go back and, and ask to modify these targets so that you're effectively achieving uh, within a range of, uh, of satisfaction or within a satisfactory range of outcomes. So to say somewhere between 80 and 90 percent. Uh, and of course, it's got to be a realistic target over and above the national average. Uh, and you've got to then take all the data of your school into account when you're setting that target. Um, so you may have to take um, deprivation data, um, last year's assessment data. So there can be trickier to set, um, but I think as schools become more and more driven uh, by accountability and data, um, there's never a bad reason to have them, but just allow a little bit of flexibility um, when you're actually setting the sort of precise wording uh, of that target, because otherwise you'll both become a hostage to fortune, both the member of staff and the and the appraiser. That's uh, the problem, isn't it? And you end up. Um, well, I mean, for example, we I mean, we teach obviously up to GCSEs and and, and A levels soon actually here. So mm. let's say, for the sake of argument, very briefly, I were to set a, a teacher here. The the data related target is. Um, 60% 60, 60 of your students in this particular GCC subject to achieve grade seven or above. What if, I don't know, 53% did? And that wasn't within the range. I, I hear your point about the range of satisfaction. Yeah. Brilliant. So 55 to 65% to get seven and above. What actually happens if they don't? <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think you're then into another conversation okay. about the reasons why, because there may have been okay. very good reasons why that yeah. happened. They could be mitigating, yeah, yeah. The, uh, mitigation circumstances, absolutely. Yeah. The yeah. other, the other way to do it is to sort of set an improvement target. Right. So, you know, if yes. last year's target, you know, sixty-five percent achieved, right, you want anywhere between sixty-five and seventy. Right. Um, again, it, 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 what we're trying to avoid like is making sure that people don't become hostages to fortune because the appraiser will feel rotten because they'll probably think. We've, we've set the we've set the stretch too far. Um, the person being appraised will feel rotten because they didn't quite achieve it. Um, but if it's an improvement and then of a rate an improvement range, um, then of course you know you, of course you're looking for an improvement. It's year on year uh, progress. But you know again if they so if they if the if the target was sixty five to seventy Andrew and they did sixty six or sixty nine, they'd still get the sort of um, you know the the positive uh, accreditation uh, for that. Yeah, great. I like the That's idea right. of an improvement target. Yeah, really good idea. Otherwise, it, it tends to be just an arbitrary sort of number, really. But um, it does. It yeah. does. Um, okay. Great. Um, I think the last. This is the last slide on this bit. But you know, you can see this is a, a pretty important part, um, and it it might sound blindingly obvious, but try and assess the performance on the basis that it was agreed at the beginning of the cycle. Um, what you don't want to do as an appraiser is to be shifting, you know, moving the goalposts uh, halfway because you'll just set yourself up for a challenge um, and probably a successful challenge um, from the person who's being appraised. Um, and, you know, back to this improvement target, Andrew, that second point there, you know, good progress towards a challenging, stretching uh, objective yeah. Yeah. Um, even if the performance has been modest but positive uh, it can still be assessed uh, favorably um, there's often disagreement uh, between whether someone's achieved a target uh, or not yeah um, I mean that goes across all sorts of uh, areas of, of business schools and, and not schools. Schools. Um, but obviously there is the uh, possibility to appeal uh, and, and for an adjudicator, you know, third person to come and look at that. Mm. Um, it's very important that there, there is agreement because you want a positive end of the destination before you start departing again yeah. on, a, on a new year. Yeah. Um, with GDPR, um, I know it's a sort of, gosh, it's over four years now we've had GDPR, would you, would you believe? But you know, people often say, what should we do with the appraisal documentation when it's over? Well, yeah, we put it on their file, but then what? 
Um, well, there's a good argument not to put it on their file. Uh, put a copy on their file, absolutely. Um, but good performance management documents should be dog-eared. Uh, people should have it in front of them, should be referring to it all the time should be having an ed evidence file to make sure that they are building up the evidence uh, to support their claim, uh, should be using it uh, to sit alongside the school's CPD coordinator, if a school has one, uh, to make sure that they are getting the um, CPD that they need uh, or that they want uh, in order to progress to the next uh, level of, of teaching. Um, once uh, all of that is gathered, uh, someone in the school, probably a school business manager, um, should make sure that the, all these records are kept in a secure place. They don't all have to be in individual files. They could just be kept securely um, for six years uh, and then destroyed. So that's the GDPR recommendation um, that uh, otherwise you can imagine, can't you, big schools, they would be just literally filling filing cabinets year after year after year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's not a bad place to then keep them in the same place. You don't have to yeah. keep them in personnel files as long as they're secure. Yeah. Um, and last but not least, um, when you're the appraiser and you're making a pay recommendation uh, as part of the appraisal process, it should be, and this is the number one point that, that was set out in the regulations, it should be clearly attributable to the performance of the employee. Um, and if it's not, uh, it may there may well be um, some. If there's any scrutiny by the school's HR team um, or any other scrutineer, um, they'll have a good reason to push it back at you. Um, and the last thing there on, on the good practice slide, I think, in in, in total, Andrew is, is making sure that uh, once all the pay recommendations have been gathered. Um, that the head teacher ensures that they're uh, in line with some prevailing legislation. Uh, and that by that, I mean equal pay. Uh, and again, they can sit alongside their HR partner or school business manager or deputy, perhaps, and make sure that there are no, what I'd call sort of red flags uh, in the pay system uh, that are, are sort of beginning to build organically uh, without being checked and balanced. And is it, um, thank you, Guy, and, and just a quick question from Helen. Is it the same? Is it six years they need to be retained in a secured place if the staff member has retired? Uh, yes. After retirement? Yeah. Uh, yes, six years full stop, because there's a possibility mm -hmm. that if, if any litigation were to take place post-retirement, um, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's down to the sort of old limitations legislation that it's fair and reasonable to keep them for a number of years after which the prospect of any action uh, being raised is, is pretty much nil. Um, you know, if, if someone's gonna raise a tribunal uh, with a school, they've got three months within which to do it. They can extend that in exceptional circumstances. So uh, a lot of schools, a lot of employers I know will get rid of this, their stuff sooner, but um, I, I think this is an area where the NHT feel a little nervous still until GDPR has become absolutely culturally embedded, um, that we stick to the GDPR regulations, which is six years. And again, they don't have to be secured on the school site. The school may have a, a, an off-site provision um, or, or delegate it to a, a third party provider. Um, otherwise they're, they're, they'll run out of room in big schools to uh, keep it all. Yeah. So. Just a quick one. Have we got time for a, for a quick question, Guy, or not? Yeah, absolutely. If um, if you've got a member of staff, uh, and I'm not, I'm not talking about here, by the way, of course, couldn't possibly. But if you've got a, if you've got you know several members of staff, let's say who who have been teaching for a considerable time, many many years, good service in the same school or or in other schools, but whatever whatever wherever they've been teaching, they're at UPS three and they're sat there for a considerable time. How? How do you in, how do you actually incentivize them to to really go for those stretching sort of challenging targets and and do you know, do you know what I mean? It's, mm. it's a tricky one because they keep banging their head on the ceiling and clearly a school can't afford for everybody to move up to leadership scale, can they? No, and this is <laughs> something we'll come on. <laughs> this is something we'll come on to, and it's a, okay. it's a perennial problem in in we'll any organisation. I mean, 
you know, you get a very good teacher who goes up the main pay scale, jumps across the upper pay scale, goes up those three levels. And then, as you say, they're continuously banging their head against this glass ceiling. And it may be that, you know, someone just needs to sit down with them and say, look, you know, you, you've pretty much reached the top of the upper pay scale. That doesn't mean to say that we can't enrich your working life or enlarge your working life. And we'll go on to some examples of that in a moment. OK. Um, right. Or, you know, they have to accept that if, if they don't want to go into management, uh, i.e. school management, assistant head, deputy head, etc., cetera, um, they then have to look at the other teaching options uh, or other non-teaching options, which are, you know, are available in schools. Uh, and we'll touch on those in, 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 a, in a wee while. OK, yeah. But and yeah, find, great point. Yeah, I find that the targets that I tend to set to teachers like that are, are very much linked, as they jolly well should be, to upper pay scale expectations, to whole school responsibilities, to things, to being proactive. You yes. Know, so yeah. forth. Anyway. <laughs> great. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, this is really what we're going up, going on to sort of talk about. Really, how do you, how do you manage that? The sort of okay, you've to, you've had a, a bunch of people. They've performed. You've given them the. You've taken them through the process. You've given them their pay rise. You think, oh gosh, here we go again. Uh, year in, year out of, of 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 this sort of process. And of course, we're all in it from day one. Um, so we we have to recognise that we're all in the PM process from day one. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, performance is, is uh, I try and separate staff appraisal, which I see as one meeting or as a series of short meetings, um, to performance management, which I think is the sort of wider term to, 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 right. to really describe some of those things there that we've got induction, uh, yeah. the appraisal meetings, the gathering of the evidence, the classroom observations, the training, the inset days, etc. Um, and, you know, one of the things you've, you've just highlighted there, Andrew, is that, that different staff will have different expectations from the system. Yeah. Uh, and there are some staff, and God bless them, you know, and I don't mean that, there, there, there's, there's nothing meant in that, intended in that, who actually are very happy to be main scale classroom teachers and to come in and teach. Thank goodness. Uh, for, for year in year, and they're often the backbone of the school. Absolutely right. Because uh, uh, you can't have everyone knocking on your door <laughs> saying, I want to be a leading practitioner or I want to be X or Y or Z. Uh, and I think part of the, the school leadership team, part of their, their sort of responsibility, uh, I would say, is to sort of analyse that and, and just sort of say, where is the talent? Where is the future? Yeah. Um, where yeah. is the... Uh, I remember doing a very... Uh, having a meeting at Lambeth um, our Lambeth branch um, and one of the things they'd highlighted to me is that we have a maturing workforce yep. uh, very particular in London where people don't tend to move around a great deal they tend to stay yeah. in their locality because yeah, it's just too it costs too much money and takes too much time to travel elsewhere and they said it's not a problem it really isn't um, but actually we've our teachers are getting older um, not a new ones, not not enough new ones are coming through, and we did a whole piece, and there's a there's a piece on um, pathway, isn't there, of of how you can continue to develop a maturing workforce, yeah, uh, and what steps you can do uh, to 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 actually, and it's the same part of the same problem, isn't it? As people sort of serve more years, of course, they're getting older, uh, and how do you keep those people motivated? Um, but we'll, we'll touch on some of the sort of individual uh, matters. In a moment. I talked about enrichment and enlargement, um, and that's very much where you can enrich a job by adding responsibilities to it, um, not just ad infinitum, but you, you might want to adjust some of the responsibilities that is in that role, or you may want to enlarge it. Um, I'm not necessarily verging on the TLR uh, teaching, and, teaching and learning responsibility territory here, but there are opportunities to enlarge jobs uh, as well as to enrich them. Um, it, it doesn't, and that doesn't mean to say they're moving up pay scales or moving into another area of uh, of teaching. Um, so you know, it's it's one of those where we we may want, want to sort of keep an eye on, and we'll touch on that in a, in a little moment. Um, 
there's other things there, of course, like career development. Um, you know, if you're spotting talent and somebody's asking you to to break through that glass ceiling, is is one of the reasons they're not doing so because they haven't got the the skills or the qualifications to do so. And therefore, having that meeting, as you said, in January, February, where you're really highlighting that issue to them, uh, would be a great, great uh, opportunity to have that wider uh, training and development conversation with them. Um, but yeah, it's about meeting expectations, I guess, isn't it? It is. It is. And keeping keeping everybody motivated. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Perennial issue for managers everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think we go on to, um, yeah, applications to be paid. I won't, I, I'm not going to labour on these individuals because I would imagine most people on the call are familiar with um, main pay range, upper pay range. Um, these are all set out, you'll see on the slide down there on that sort of uh, rather isolated sentence, the STPCD. And I'm always very surprised, Andrew, at how many people don't know what that is. Um, you can pop it into the, the Google search. It stands for the School Teachers Pay and Conditions document. It's around 80 pages long. Um, it actually is a very good document and all head teachers and all school leaders should have a copy on their desk. And if they don't, I'd, I'd uh, really encourage them to do so. Yeah. This is where the framework of employment for all teachers from QTS, well, unqualified, yeah. right up to the leadership group is set out uh, in terms of pay, responsibilities. Uh, and this is where applications uh, to be paid on the upper pay range uh, can, be, uh, can be found uh, with all the criteria and the definitions of highly competent, uh, and substantial and sustained. These aren't just my words, these are definitions that are set out in the STPCD. But I think if any school leader is struggling to um, establish how they might effectively manage someone on the May pay range, well, uh, if someone's got two or more years uh, teaching experience and evidence, um, one of the most obvious ones, and we're starting with the most obvious one, is to uh, encourage that teacher to uh, apply to, to be paid on the upper pay range. Yeah. Um, so that's all I'm going to say on that particular slide. Um, TLRs. Um, get a lot of calls about TLRs. Um, and I think it's because people, you know, they, I think sometimes there's a gap in their understanding. Um, what is actually, what is a TLR? Is it permanent? Is it temporary? Uh, can you take it away from somebody? Um, well, let me just sort of demystify them for a moment. So there are now three TLRs. There used to be two, uh, but TLR three is for very much a time limited piece of work. Um, the only difference really between TLR one and two but it, it, uh, it actually is quite a significant difference when it comes to the payment of uh, money, is line management. Um, where there's line management involved uh, for a significant number of people, that will automatically put whatever responsibility that teacher is assigned into TLR1. Where there's no line management, it may be a project, for example, but, or a permanent responsibility that doesn't carry uh, line management responsibility, that by definition is tier two. They are permanent. Um, you cannot, no teacher who's got one can say, I want to give it back. Um, I mean, they can, but effectively what they're saying is, I don't want to do this whole job anymore, yeah. which includes a TLR. Yeah. Um, so you could transfer them to another teaching post and then advertise that post. But you can't take away a TLR. It is a permanent condition of employment. Uh, and that's where we get most of the calls from. And just finally on TLRs, Andrew, there's a, I, I would say it's a good piece because I wrote it, but there's, a, there's a, a really good sound piece of advice on Pathway about the reasonable expectations of teachers without a TLR. Um, it, it really serves as a checklist 
for approving a TAR and a defence against approval for, for school leaders. It's the document that really sets out what a TLR is and what a TLR isn't, because a lot of teachers who have a TLR might see someone who's doing some other uh, role and say, well, they haven't got one. Um, well, that's because that role ha doesn't fall into that TLR category. Um, and you can ask classroom teachers to do a little bit more uh, without automatically triggering a TLR. And that's that grey area which that bit of advice tends to uh, tends to cover. I'm really struck, Guy, by what because it's surprised I didn't know this, and I've been I've been issuing TLRs um, most recently actually for various new whole school responsibilities. But the the idea that it is permanently and inextricably linked to a teacher's role really, and their mm. their, their their very job here, that if you remove it, well, you can't remove it unless you remove the whole role. Really, is that what you mean? Yeah, misunderstood that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a common misunderstanding. And I think because they're set out as TLRs, people have always thought, well, they're add-ons. Pick and choose. Uh, yeah. yeah, people can pick and choose them. Uh, but we get a lot of school leaders who call and say, got some on a TLR. Frankly, they've been brilliant, but they don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. And, and that's fine. Yeah. But you can't just remove the TLR and ask them to carry on with their job. Um, oh. you'd have to sort of effectively remodify their role and responsibilities, put them back into a, a non-TLR post, and then open up the TLR post for, as a vacancy. Um, so, you know, you, you said you can add them on as TLR3. Um, and, you know, obviously some schools who don't recognise the SCPCD, um, and many won't and don't, um, so lots of academies won't recognise the STPCD, some independent schools won't recognise it, and therefore they're not necessarily tied to it. But for those that are recognised, the STPCD would apply to, which is every maintained school in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, or the equivalents of, they've got slightly different variations. Um, but obviously, lots of other schools, academies and independent schools included, do sort of carry on the conventions of the STPCD because they're tried and tested and they seem to make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're not necessarily uh, bound by the terms of the STPCD, that will give you more flexibility okay. um, in, yeah. in their application. Very good. Okay. Thank you. So okay. should we... Uh, yeah. 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 Um, Senko um, uh, seems to be an increasing role. Um, mm. The longer I'm at the NHC, the more Senkos we appear to have. Mm. Uh, and we set up, we, we, we hold conferences for them and uh, we've written additional pieces of advice on the Pathway Hub. Yeah, we have. And NHT for them. Um, but again, it's an area where I was talking about enrichment and enlargement. It's a good example of uh, someone who, who may come to you as a school leader and say, I want more than I've got. Um, you know, what, what are my options for future progression? Now, you may not have a Senko vacancy at that time, um, but they may, they may want to take the qualification to become one. Um, so by the time they're qualified, um, the, the chances are there will be a vacancy. Um, and I, I see, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of, um, I guess, people of our age, Andrew, when, when we went to school, um, the, this whole area of, of Senko was embryonic. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't called Senko. No, it wasn't called Senko. Uh, it, it was, you know, less flattering terms were used in, in many schools that I, I was aware of. Um, but now it's become a, a huge area of, of activity, um, generally considered to be, uh, you know, a, a key part of any school. Um, and, you know, Senkos can often be shared across more than one school, of course. Um, and again, I think it's a, a terrific example of um, where somebody has either set out to, to become one, 
um, or if there's an example of, of, of enrichment and enlargement you want for a role, then perhaps the mention of Senko uh, might be particularly relevant uh, to particular school leaders, uh, school teachers rather. Such a key role, such an important role. And possibly the most, one of the most rewarding roles, I think, uh, in a school. Um, it does carry a, a financial incentive. Um, and, um, you know, that's hoped to, to be sufficient uh, for the additional work that that creates. But again, it's down to the school leader to establish how much demand there'd be for that role and what impact that might have uh, on the person who's occupying that post. And, and, and the, the, the role and the influence that a really good Senko can have, not only on the pupils, but on the staff is, is brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what the Senko here, and we were very, very lucky. We have somebody who really, really knows their stuff. And the support that she provides for the staff, obviously, ultimately for the pupils, is brilliant. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm glad we've recognised that here. Good. Um, okay. Additional payments. Yes. Now, this, the, 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 this will get ears pricking up. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, there is a provision in the STPCD um, for flexibility. Uh, for certain areas of activity. Yeah. Uh, and those are outlined there in A to D. And again, these are all set out in the STPCD. So the relevant body may, and this is again, Andrew, this is probably the best example I can give you. So when I mentioned job enlargement, job enrichment, yeah. people are probably thinking, oh, he's going to flannel over that and yeah. not come back with any examples. <laughs> well, here are the examples. Yeah. Um, uh, and those examples are for jobs that can be enlarged and enriched and for which additional payments are perfectly allowable, legitimate, yeah. can be made uh, for as long as the project or responsibility lasts. Yeah. And I think when we talk about additional payments, it's sometimes new to some people. Uh, they think I'd love to recognize the work that a person does over there, not just by saying thank you, but you know, put a few more quid in their back pocket I'd really love to recognise it because, you know, I want continuity when they've gone. And, you know, sometimes we, we need more than a thank you. Um, we need a thank you plus a bit more. Um, and that's the plus a bit more. So I think it's quite a, a healthy way of legitimately and fairly uh, recognising people for the contribution they make. I agree. Um, so look out for that one, folks additional payments it's all set out in the STPCD uh, and it's a really good to have this in your toolkit if you've got someone as Andrew said sort of knocking on the, the glass ceiling um, and you sort of say I'd love to be able to do something to that of course everything we talk about today isn't it uh, is always subject to a school's budget um, <laughs> that's true, <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> I'm not naive enough to think that it's not no, but um, you know Absolutely. How much you want to, to sort of uh, exercise is, is entirely up to you, but yeah. it's there. The toolkit is there. Yeah. Um, the other one, I think this is possibly the last one we've got in our sort of toolkit, really, is the, the LP role, leading practitioner role. Um, again, this is set out in the STPCD. Um, those are the three uh, additional duties, if you like. Um, that uh, obviously it's, a, it's about school improvement, it's about pupil progress, uh, and it's about the staff and colleagues. Um, and you think, well, you know, those are the three things that we were talking about, weren't we, Andrew, when we were talking about objectives. That's right. Um, pupil progress, um, you know, improving the effectiveness of staff across the school, uh, and school improvement. Um, and they are all part of the leadish, leadishing, uh, leading practitioner role. Not every school has got one. I would say it's probably a large minority of schools that have this role, uh, because you need to be of a particular size of school to probably entertain the very prospect of having the role. Um, but often this role is shared amongst more than one school. Uh, so if you're running a small school, this is the sort of thing that you might think, well, we could benefit from um, you know, tapping into a leading practitioner role. And there are the, 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 the that's what they must do uh, in order to achieve um, their leading practitioner status and the remuneration uh, that goes on that. 
All of that is set out in the STPCD. Um, this is a, you know, probably one of the most, probably it's in terms of status, uh, the, the most senior of teaching, pure teaching roles yeah. uh, or classroom based roles. Um, but we've talked about others. And I haven't purposely gone into, Andrew, I haven't purposely gone into uh, head of year or head of subject or head of, you know, because I think those would be, you know, seen very much as conventional ways to enrich and enlarge someone's role. These are the ones that are perhaps a little more formalised um, and perhaps one or two that, that people weren't clear about or sure about, um, a bit like the TLRs and the additional payments right. parts yeah. of the toolkit. Brilliant. So that's the, um, and I think here, I don't want to sort of brush across or smooth over uh, staff appraisal without looking uh, at, you know, obviously not all conversations go well. Mm. Um, that's just life. Not everyone in the school will be exceptional. Um, and here are some tips um, pulled out of, uh, you know, our policy and, and my experience of um, making sure that you tackle these issues, however difficult, head on. Um, I won't read them out, they're there, but uh, you know, no surprises here, Andrew. 90% of having these conversations are around good communication, having your mid-year review, so you're signalling some of the issues that you may be experiencing with performance early on. Yep. Um, you know, appraisal should have no surprises, mm -hmm. um, and, but they will have a surprise if you've carried on for 12 months and not told someone that they're not, um, you know, pulling their weight. Um, but, but I think it's also incumbent and responsible for um, head teachers and appraisers, all head, all appraisers, to sit down and discuss that with per, with someone because there may well be personal circumstances yeah. that are above and beyond, and, and which that person has chosen to keep private uh, from school. Um, but again, the mid year review hopefully would would have uh, flushed some of those out, um, and therefore their their performance needs to be seen as in the whole. Uh, rather than just the, the necessarily the file of evidence. Yeah. Um, so that's really what I'm going to, you know, all of this is in the, the pack that we're going to send people. Great. I'm aware of time. And so I just don't want to go on too much, but I didn't want to brush over the difficult conversations part of appraisal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there it's, it, it carries on. Um, I think with all of these things, it's really important to, to ensure that where you have identified uh, insufficient, unsatisfactory performance, that you check that all the, the basics have been put in place, um, that they have their job description, that they have been through their induction, that they have had their professional standards uh, and objectives clearly made out or stated them. And the reason why I'm telling you that, uh, folks, is that, um, you know, I, I work for a trade union and we often defend people, uh, including head teachers, who haven't had the most flattering uh, appraisal. Uh, and one of the things that we often uh, discover uh, is that someone hasn't been in, kept in the loop, uh, hasn't been invited to meetings, uh, haven't been engaged in the activities that they should have been engaged on or in, um, and it's little wonder that they get to a point in the school year where they perhaps haven't achieved as much as they thought they had or would have liked to have done. Um, and I think what a, a good trade union would do is to look back at the year and say, were you engaged at that particular moment? Um, did you have that uh, involvement in the offset inspection where that was identified and for which you were res responsible? Um, so again, I think it's it's really important that um, we we sort of tackle these on because otherwise, what you'll end up doing is facing, as the notes there say, a prolonged period of sickness absence. Uh, and I'm sure we've probably all experienced one or two of those, uh, where members of staff uh, do absent themselves, 
rather than face the full force of the school's capability procedure. Um, but to take a gentle but comprehensive approach in the, in the first instance is going to be far more uh, appealing to you, to them, and far more positive an outcome uh, for the school uh, parents and pupils. So I think, um, yeah, uh, you know, I think it's really important that you, you, you recognise that <coughs> one of the reasons you can dismiss someone in the UK is for poor performance, whether that's ill health related or capability related. Um, and it's one of those five areas, because there are five uh, reasons for a fair dismissal, which is why we focus so much on it today, because um, if you were to get any of this wrong uh, in, a, in a fairly profound way, in a fairly uh, big way, um, you would find it's difficult to dismiss that member of staff without being successfully challenged. Um, and that's obviously one thing we want to avoid, yeah. um, putting you in that position. So I think it's getting it right. Um, the costs of getting it right are always lower than the costs of getting it wrong. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's um, good advice. And this, these last few slides just help underline some of those points uh, to help keep you in control uh, yeah. of a situation. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to go into these details because I think they're sort of um, relatively straightforward. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's, you know, all I would ask people to do is look at that last line on that yeah. slide. Um, I went to, a, I attended a course many, many years ago. Uh, I think it was given by ACAS. Um, mm. And it was all about that last line on that slide. Mm. And it's not difficult. Uh, management can be simplified if you're those three Fs. Yeah. Um, and um, I think if you're friendly, you're approachable, people will open up to you. If you're fair, uh, people will respect you. And if you're firm, uh, people will respect you even more, uh, including the parents and the pupils and every stakeholder connected to the school. So in all of this, that's the, the, that, that's the way to go. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, and avoiding the pitfalls. <laughs> avoiding the pitfalls. Couple of minutes on these. Um, evidence, evidence, evidence. Um, make sure whatever decision you make at the end of the year, you have the evidence to support it. Yeah. Uh, don't forget about the equalities considerations. They can come back and bite you hard uh, if you do. If if in doubt, take some counsel. Uh, we've got some good advice on our website about equal pay, for example. Um, don't forget appraisal. Determines pay. Um, don't be afraid to have those difficult conversations. And if you are, if you are struggling to have those, then it's probably because you're not confident in having them. You're perfectly capable. Um, some people can have a lot of capability and very little confidence. So, I would I would attend a, a sort of course on brushing up on having those difficult conversations calls. Um, so you know, make sure that those are uh, things that you're prepared to do, and you won't go too far wrong. If we could I've, move. Some of those difficult conversations I tend to have with people who have um, a lot of confidence, but not so much capability. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we with a few of those. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Never the twain shall meet. No. Um, yeah. I think, are there any more, Andrew? The... No, that's the last one, I think, actually. Right. Uh, that's the, oh, no, sorry. There is another one here. Clear communication. This is okay. a different one. Yeah. Well, obvious first one. I think obviously the second one, accountability rests with the head teacher. Yeah. It doesn't rest with the chair of governors, it's the head teacher. Yeah. Uh, so make sure you're, you're on top of this process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, care, and and be, be, be careful to sort of perhaps recognize where people are in their career stage and yeah. what their expectations Their expectations are likely to mirror their career stage, um, but don't underestimate them. Um, don't talk about, don't forget about informal support. Uh, and if you're going to offer informal support, front load the support yeah. and gradually withdraw it as the time goes on. Yeah. Because uh, you want to be able to evaluate them at the end of that period when they should be self-sufficient. Mm. 
Um, don't forget about long-term absentees and those on maternity leave. Um, they also need appraising. Uh, details of them that will, uh, in, the, in the material that you'll get. And I think this is the last one. Anyone who's got a conflict of interest, um, you know, really ought to absent themselves. So if you feel that your role as an appraiser or appraisee is conflicted with the other person sitting on the other side of the desk, because you might be related to them. Uh, for example, you might be uh, their best friend. There's a conflict of interest there, uh, and clearly that needs to be uh, removed from an objective process. Otherwise, it's subjective, and you're storing up trouble for tomorrow. Absolutely. Brilliant. Last one. Brilliant. Well done, Guy. <laughs> that was a that was a lot to get through, but really succinctly presented, and. Uh, I don't know about other people. I've made I've made copious notes here while you're talking, <laughs> as I always do. So um, I'll just go a last sweep for any questions or comments. Doesn't look like we have. I'm gonna we've we've gone slightly over time, but you did it so well in such a time, and everybody stayed. So thank you very much for staying. I'm gonna offer just a two three minute absolute sort of sprint through how Pathway itself we think really will support. Um, the appraisal process it'll take me two or three minutes i'm going to show you that in a moment if you wish to stay but if you want to find out more about uh, future events like these webinars uh, you can check out the discovery education website there forward slash uh, events so please do and my uh, my brilliant colleague there you go i mean it's just just so efficient thank you so much where would we possibly be without bobby's so bobby's already put some stuff in there already when the next advice current uh, times webinar is find out more about pathway itself from NAHT and Discovery Education, together in partnership, presenting Pathway to you. And Guy has a leading role in the advice of, of, of Pathway and really guiding us all in that respect. So I'm going to show you some of the advice of pieces in a moment, which Guy has, uh, has authored and edited himself, which is brilliant. So um, just remains for me to say thank you, Guy, for joining us. You're very welcome for this quick, quick uh, sprint through Pathway. But if, uh, if not, um, look forward to seeing you on the next webinar when we will hit the same sort of issues that I know are going to be in people's inboxes at the time. So, I hope so. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the uh, the rest of the week. And um, I'll turn off my video, but I'll carry on listening, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed. Well, it's All been the best. Brilliant to see you again, as always. So I'm now going to just very quickly jump onto the Pathway um, website. If people are able to stay for a bit, that'd be terrific. If, uh, if you're already familiar with Pathway and you need to go, then, of course, of course, please do. But uh, look forward to seeing you next time. So how do we think Pathway is going to help? Well, as you know, I mean, I'm not going to do a full demo of Pathway. There isn't the time now. But you can find out much more about it by visiting the, the website in the chat stream now. Um, but uh, essentially, we feel that because we built it in order to help you orientate your career, first of all, and the sections within orientation, we think are absolutely perfect for an appraisal conversation. The guide to motivation, what motivates you, what demotivates you. What a great thing to be talking about in, the, in an initial appraisal meeting. A skills audit where you can self-reflect, really, self-assess, identify your strengths, some of the areas for development matched against the teacher standards and leadership, uh, some leadership competencies and standards that we've identified. You can, and it's a brilliant way of doing that. So you ask a series of questions and you can actually rate and rank some of the different strengths and areas for development that you have based on those teacher standards. Go into an appraisal meeting with that as a script. It makes for a much more purposeful, meaningful conversation. And your career map, indeed. There is a facility on Pathway. Each an individual login can actually, person who's logging in, can actually map out your career choices, what you want to be doing in terms of securing those professional roles in the future, in the medium, long term, short term. And then also some extracurricular activities, the co-curricular offer, all those other activities that you enjoy doing and enrich both your life and the, and the children's lives. You can map those out in the years ahead. And then most crucially, perhaps, and often ignored, is your health and your well-being goals, those physical health, mental health, well-being goals that you can set out in the career map. Go into an appraisal meeting with that. I think it'll make, make it a much more enriching, holistic discussion. Navigation, as you'll know by now, is where we house many, many, many different online courses, all built in a similar way with films, with questions for reflection, coaching questions, if you like, with academic pieces for you to read and reflect on and recommended reading. I mean, each course takes several hours, so it's a tremendous uh, um, 
set of different uh, CPD uh, courses to develop both your personal and professional careers. But but I think from a, a, an appraisal point of view, you could actually attach one of these courses to one of their targets, perhaps attach it to a number of people's targets, and then you can actually encourage them to go through each course, perhaps almost like a mini book club, seeing the films together, writing those questions for reflection, the answers to those questions for reflection together, as a book club perhaps might do, or attach it to one person and one target. But you'll see each of those courses and perhaps on the next webinar we can we can showcase all of those um, many, many opportunities on the Discovery Education website to find out more about these different courses. But each one is divided into some fascinating films and reading pieces and questions for reflection. As I said, this one, for example, could well be an interesting whole, all school, you know, whole school focus. Perhaps this is the whole school target for your appraisal this year. And you've got a way of showing evidence that you are actually developing uh, towards uh, exceeding and succeeding this target by showing that they're going through the course and they're writing their reflections in answer to each of those questions that follow each film. So that might be perhaps a whole school focus. The reflection piece we've talked a lot about, I'm going through it quickly now because of time. There is a brilliant wellbeing course, a wellbeing program devised by Professor Tim O'Brien and Dr. Dr. Dennis Guiney. And it's a terrific, terrific course on wellbeing and critical reflection. And then the advice of that we've referred to all the way through this evening's webinar authored by, uh, by Guy Dudley and his team at the NH, NHT advice team, and a whole host of different categories, um, each of which contain many, many different PDF advice pieces that have been written by Guy and his team. I mean, this is just one section, human, human resources, HR. Anybody in leadership will know that this HR section is gonna be a big one, and it requires a lot of our time, uh, but if we get it right, and we can get it right by following this advice here, and there will be a lot of advice in here that will be useful for making sure you manage the, the appraisal process correctly and in a way that motivates um, your staff. Right, I hope that's been useful. It was a, a very quick sprint through what is an enormous program of CPD and development programs and so forth. I hope this has been useful for you. I'm Andrew Hammond. I look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. In the meantime, do feel free to click on those, uh, those URLs in the chat from my brilliant colleague, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby, for your help this afternoon, uh, where you can find out more about Pathway and about future events. Until next time, thanks so much for, for joining us. And I hope you enjoy the week and have a lovely weekend when it comes. Take care, thanks so much.